on the YouTube. It's Barbara Jean. Okay, like I said, I'm going to try to make these videos a lot shorter, but it might be a little difficult. But what I have to say is pretty important. It's pretty amazing what the Lord showed me. Last week I was in the presence of the Lord. Well, I'm in the presence of the Lord every day, but that's not the, that's not the point. The point was I was in the presence of the Lord last week. There was This was about a week ago. And the word, this word popped into my head. Just pop! There it was. And the word is reprobate. Yes, reprobate. Came popping into my head. Now, I'm just going to give you um, the word and where it's found in the... Hold on just a second. Where it's found in the New Testament. This is not a very good start to making these videos. <laughs> Shorter, but there it is. Okay, um, so you'll find the word reprobate in the New Testament and the Old Testament. One place in the Old Testament is Jeremiah 6.30 and Romans 1.28. That whole passage there is about those who are who have a reprobate mind. And you'll find that Romans uh, 1 actually matches very much what, uh, what he said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3 and also in Titus 1.16 those who have a reprobate. And I was I thought it was rather interesting the Lord gave me this word. It's like um, <laughs> the New World Order calls us useless eaters. Well, God calls them useless thinkers. Useless thinkers. Worthless thinkers. Reprobate. Um, actually, I'm just going to read quickly the passage in Romans. If you will, actually, I'll give you the whole passage here, the, the whole uh, passage to read. Um, it's Romans... Uh, Romans 1, 18 through, say, Romans 1, 18 through 32, 2 Timothy 3, 1 through, all oh, the way to the end, basically, to verse 17. Um, just read those passages, and you'll understand what I'm talking about, how they're very similar in what he, uh, Paul talks about um, in Romans, to the Romans, and also to Timothy in 2 Timothy. So reprobate is, uh, I looked up the word, it means useless, worthless. Um, it's like, you know, how you put something, on, you put your seal of approval. These people have no, when you when you have an item or, or something that's worth value, you put your seal of approval on it. Well, reprobate is the opposite. <laughs> totally unapproved, disapproved, um, worthless. Okay. So you'll find that these people who have reprobate, useless minds, mind control, that's why, and that's what the next thing that came to me, after reprobate, what came to my mind was mind controlled, because these people are under the control of Satan, under the, the power of Satan's suggestion. They cannot think of anything good, they're, they're conspirators, liars, deceivers, everything that you can imagine that are listed in these two passages about those who have reprobate minds, even disobedient parents. That is also part of being a reprobate, interestingly enough. Now, why did this all come to my mind? And why, what, what's this video about? Well, this is the video about hope. Because I want do want to read a couple of verse, verses. I know it's going to take up some time, but I want you to, and if it takes too long, and I'll have to restart to my next video, because I can't, like I said, can't let the videos go too long because they, the New World Order does not like my videos and for good reason. They have never liked my videos right from the start of my YouTube channel. They have censored it. So anyway, let's just go on. I want to read actually something here. Um, 1 Corinthians 15, starting at verse 25. He must reign till he put he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death, for he has put all things under his feet. But when he hath said all things are are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that hath put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So what I wanted to point out here was that Jesus, it says here in 1 Corinthians, that are, is it Colossians? No, 1 Corinthians, that that Jesus must reign. He will reign here on earth uh, before he comes back. He will put all things, all things under his feet. All enemies will be under his feet, under his subjection. Um, I also wanted to read um, 
something. I'm going somewhere with this, so just stay with me, okay? So then it says here, um, um, oh, let's read Ephesians 1.18. The eyes of your understanding be enli enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of his glory inheritance in, in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word, who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. So it's talking about the Father who has is so mighty in power and raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Um, and Jesus is sitting at his right hand. Far above all principalities and power and might and dominions and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Now, I wanted to read something here in Second Timothy, the passage I gave you earlier, Second Timothy, chapter three. There's something here I want you to see, which I thought was rather interesting. Now, this passage starts out with um, that it's talking about the last days. And I know, you know that we're talking about the last days in this passage because it says so. <laughs> First Timothy 3, 1. This know also that in the last days, perilous, day, perilous times shall come. Okay? So this is talking about the last days. And he's talking about the reprobate minds that will emerge and wax worse and worse. They're getting worse and worse and worse. And we can see this. This is happening right in front of our face right in front of our, our noses. It's happening on a daily basis. We're seeing them waxing worse and worse and worse. Because why? Because they're desperate. That's why. Because they can't control the church. And I'm going to show you this. This is amazing. So it says here, um, <clears throat> now I'm going to go down to verse 8. Oh, the, the, it talks about how these reprobate minds are capturing the minds of the weak-minded, uh, foolish women, um, they're weak in mind, so they're easily led, basically. They're they're like lambs to the slaughter um, because they, they have weak minds, and therefore they're easily led. And verse 8 says, Now as Janus and Jambres, these are two wizards or sorcerers in the times of Moses in the Pharaoh's court. Now, now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, though they opposed, they were uh, the part of the powers and principalities and dominions that were holding... Uh, the, the, uh, the people of Israel, the Hebrews, in the land of Egypt so that they couldn't leave on their escape or to leave the land to the promised land, these two wizards and sorcerers stood in opposition to Moses and using all their powers and wizardry to, to blind the mind of Pharaoh, to blind the minds of the Egyptian, and to fight the forces of, of God to keep the people enslaved in the land of Egypt. Now, this is now remember this passage is about the last days. So listen to this. This is really cool. Now, as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. The truth, men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith, that they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also. That is cool. You know what that's saying? It's saying that as in the same time when, when the, the, the Hebrews were getting ready to leave for the promised land under the direction of Moses, under the leadership of Moses, and this wicked evil force of Janus and Jambres, these sorcerers, were trying to prevent them from leaving because, remember, the truth sets you free. And they this wicked, deceitful liars sorcerers were trying to withstand the power of God. But as in the days of Moses, the same is today that they shall be stopped. Listen to this. These corrupt-minded, mind-controlled, under the control of Satan, reprobate thinkers, useless thinkers, useless minds, these corrupt men, that's what it says here, men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith, but they shall proceed no further in the last days. They will be stopped, just as Janus and Jambres were stopped. 
So in the last days, they will be stopped. For their folly shall be manifest, be, be manifest unto all men as also there was. Theirs was. So what it's saying here is that these evil men, the New World Order, the cabal, these wicked uh, men who uh, call themselves Jews but are actually Luciferians, uh, uh, who actually worship Lucifer, who follow the um, Talmud rather than the Torah, who Pharisees, these are actually Pharisees, um, Pharisee, uh, Pharisaical um, laws and ideas and ideology. And uh, it, it surprised me when I looked, when someone, I, I listened to a video on how the, what the, the Pharisees actually believed. It was actually quite evil. In fact, extremely evil. Sex with children three years old, and that was okay. That's actually in the Talmud. That's amazingly evil. Un incredibly evil. But anyway, as I was as I was listening to this, I was like, wow, that's amazing. That's horrible. That's Luciferian. It's witchcraft. It's horrible. But these people are under such control of corrupt mind. They're reprobate, evil, useless thinkers. But anyway, what it's saying here, that they will be stopped and exposed. Now, why is that important? Because we're living in the last days. The church will not be prevailed against. Now, let's just read that scripture. I know I'm getting a getting a little ahead of myself, but what's happening is I'm trying to get everything in in a short period of time. But anyway, um, in the passage of Matthew 16, um, it says here um, from, say, 13 to uh, 19, I want you to see this, that the, he, um, Jesus, uh, Peter pronounces Jesus, excuse me, Peter is the, thou is, he is the Christ, he is the Messiah and the son of the living God. And and as a result, Jesus pronounces him the premier apostle, basically, at this moment, and says, this is what will open, the, this is one of the keys of, hev um, of heaven, this pronunciation, this acceptance and re realization that he is the son of the living God. He is the Messiah, is what is one of the keys that open the doors of heaven. Um, and he gives him this, he says, I'm going to give him the keys, in verse 18. But I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So remember that. The gates of hell will not pre prevail against this confession. The gates of hell cannot prevail against this confession. Okay? That's very, very important. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Okay? So this is a very important passage for those who want to understand the power that they have over the world, the new world order, how to be free from the reprobate, corrupt men. This is part of the being free and being set free is the confession of Jesus Christ. Peter gave us the further keys, which um, in this premier sermon, repentance, that's the confession of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and confessing your sins, um, being um, um, repentance, confession, repentance, and baptism. And then Paul continues to give us the keys of the kingdom and how to live in that freedom. Okay, now, why is this important? Because in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, we see something here that I want you to see. And I'm going to try to get this in within a few minutes. And if I don't, I'm going to have to start another video. This is what I think is important. Here we have the church of Philadelphia. That's Revelation chapter 3, starting at verse 7. And the angel of the church of Philadelphia write these things. He that he that's holy, he that's true, and he that has the key of David. Okay, so Jesus has the key of David in his hand. It's interesting how when you look at how Jesus uh, describes himself to each each church. And the it, anyway, it's another subject, but I just was going through that, and I was thinking how interesting that was, the way he, he pronounces himself before each church, because each church has its strength and its weaknesses. And, and he reveals himself to each church in a certain sort of way. Very interesting. And the rewards are very, also very interesting when you look at each church. Anyway, this church is especially blessed, especially blessed. Um, but I want you to go down to uh, verse 9 of chapter 3. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them come and worship before thy feet, to know that I have loved thee. These people are a weak, they're not as strong. This is not a, the strongest church. 
in God's, in Jesus's seven candlesticks or seven churches, seven angels. This is not the biggest, the strongest, the most politically influential church. This is, this one has a little strength. It says here, um, verse eight, for thou hast little strength and has kept my word and has not denied my name. So basically these people do not cling to man. They do not cling to Jezebel. They don't cling to worldly traditions. These people are clinging to Jesus, to clinging to the word. Who is the word? Jesus is the word. They cling to Jesus. They're obedient to Jesus. Whatever Jesus says, they do because they believe Jesus. So these people, the Church of Philadelphia, the Bride of Christ, clings to Jesus. They believe the word of Christ because he is the word. Um, they do not deny his name. Um, but this is what I really wanted to get to was verse 9 where it says, Behold, I will make them the, the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them come and worship before their feet to know that I have loved thee. Now that's a very interesting statement because as we know that only Jesus or God is worshipped. Yet this church is going to be worshipped. Why is this church going to be worshipped? Because they have God in them. When you receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which is the promise by the Lord, uh, when you are baptized, in, in Acts chapter two, jo, jo, Acts, no, Acts chapter two, when Peter is talking to the congregation that's hearing the premier the premier sermon, uh, he gives them the keys of the kingdom. He says, "Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sin, and you will in the name of Jesus, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit." So the Holy Spirit is in us. Guess who the Holy Spirit is? The Holy Spirit is God. I believe it's the feminine side of God. And whether you believe that or not is not really important at this point, but just to know that you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, the Holy Spirit is now living in you. You are now the temple of the living God. We are, your body, your flesh, your spirit man becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit. And God is now living in you. Also, I want you to realize something here, that those of the synagogue of Satan, those Luciferians of the New World Order, will not and cannot prevail against this church cannot that's what it says because they will be at the feet of the church this church will be worshiped and that's what it says behold i will make them of the synagogue of satan which say they are jews and are not but do lie behold i will make them come and worship before thy feet and to know that i have loved thee because thou hast kept the word of my patience i will keep you from the hour of tribulation or temptation which shall come upon the whole world to try them that dwell upon the earth so this church is loved, this church is indwelt with the Holy Spirit, this church is going to be worshipped, and that the synagogue of Satan cannot prevail against this church. This is what they're trying to do right now. The reason why this is important is they're trying to do this now. The New World Order, you keep hearing, how oh, it's rising, it's rising, it's rising, it's rising. Well, yeah, it is rising, but it will not prevail against this church. Because this church, first of all, will overcome it. And what I said in before, in, in, uh, how Janus and Jambres were opposing Moses when the people were getting ready to leave Egypt, trying to prevent it, though their freedom, their escape to the promised land, they were in opposition, these corrupt, reprobate minds, people who were useless thinkers, corrupt in the, to the core, were trying to oppose the, the, the escape, of, the release of these of the children of Israel, the Hebrew people, the same thing is today. There is a, a slew of witches and warlocks, reprobates, evil synagogue of Satan Luciferians who are opposing the uh, freedom of the church, the freedom of the church of Philadelphia. But the church of Philadelphia will overcome. He must, you see, Jesus must put all things under his feet. And through us, we are, through each age, each church age, as I said before, the church is dispensational. We're now in the church of Philadelphian age. The church of Laodicea doesn't happen until after the rapture. But we are right now subduing the, the powers and principalities through, by the power of Jesus Christ. Even though it doesn't appear that we have the greatest strength um, in numbers, in political influence, in money, riches, all those things, we are still the most powerful because we will be the ones that overcome the synagogue of Satan. We will be the ones that will escape. We will be the ones that overcome the new world order. 
We will be the ones that put the new world order under our feet. We will be the ones that will expose the new world order. We will expose it to the world and all men will see their corruption. You see, the beast doesn't rise until the Laodicean church age, which is only a seven year period. Or I don't know exactly if it knows it's actually seven years, but it's a seven, it, there is a seven year period in the uh, church, the Odyssean church age. But after the rapture, the, the, the beast doesn't rise. You will, the church in Philadelphia will not see the Antichrist. So if anybody thinks the Obama is the Antichrist, well, I don't think so. But personally, I don't think so. But you will not see his rise to power until after the church of Philadelphia leaves. Because why? Because the church, the gates of hell will not prevail against this church. Cannot church Phil, um, prevail against the Church of Philadelphia cannot because they will actually worship the Church of Philadelphia. This Luciferian synagogue of Satan, the New World Order, cannot prevail against the Church of Philadelphia. Period. So this is a very hopeful message to those who are afraid of the New World Order. If you're in Jesus Christ, if you have followed through with the keys of the kingdom, that are instructed by Jesus Christ himself and Peter and Paul and Philip and all the other apostles who, who were taught by Jesus Christ personally, that these are the king's keys of the kingdom. Jesus said, said himself, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That's Mark 16, 16. What is he referring to? He's referring to the rapture. The same thing in Matthew, Matthew 24, um, after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened and the moon turned to blood. You will find those same signs in the sixth seal of Revelation chapter 6. That is where the rapture, this says that the sky, the sky will be rolled back like a scroll. That indicates the rapture of the church. The sixth church, the sixth seal, they in the, that's where the rapture occurs. And then the next chapter, chapter 7, is where you see the church in heaven. So anybody tells you there's not a rapture, don't know their scriptures, have not got a clue. So don't listen to them. This is a hopeful message to let you know that all things will be put on all dominions. Right now we're putting the, the spirit of Jezebel. You know how hard it was to put to death the spirit of Jezebel? I'm telling you people, it was very, very, very difficult. It was a very strong witchcraft spirit. And I'm still a little bit struggling with it, but... It's almost gone. It's almost dead. The Jezebel spirit is almost dead in the church. At least the church of Philadelphia it is. Because you see the church, his his bride has to be without spot or wrinkle. So he's putting to death these these spirits and powers and principalities, which I just told you about in um, Ephesians. I could go back and read all those, those verses I was talking about. Ephesians chapter 1, um, 1 Corinthians 15, where it talks about how all things will be put under his feet. And when you read the book of Revelation, it's interesting that these um, the book of Revelation is actually one, um, shows you how Jesus is, um, through the past 2,000 years, when you look at the church age, and, and how when he opens each seal, Jesus is gaining more power over the enemy, more power over the enemy, more power, putting down powers and principalities with each seal he opens. And it's the church, when they overcome, that's actually allowing him to open these seals. When the church of Philadelphia has come into fullness of understanding and has broken free from the power of Jezebel and the power of these Illuminatis, these, this cabal, this, these, the synagogue of Satan and those who call themselves Jews but are not, when they have broken free, that is when we're going to be going home. Not until, Okay. So I wanted you to see that. That I think, think it's just fascinating. I think we're pretty close, people, to putting down all powers and principalities that the Church of Philadelphia. And then the Church of Laodicea, their job, those who will be left behind, Jesus doesn't want anyone to be left behind. He'd rather all come to him. But there will be many, many church people who will be left behind and people who will come to Christ during the Laodicean age. They will be under the power of uh, uh, the beast they will have to face the power and the principality of the beast the final great push um, this um, Luciferian uh, he's Lu Lucifer himself he's gonna have they're gonna have to face the devil himself because he will be cast down and he will be going out to destroy all but 
they, the Laodicean church will be um, set free uh, and they will overcome and Jesus Christ will gain more power when they allow themselves to be martyred. But that is that's another subject for another day or another video, should I say. Maybe even today, I'm not sure. But all I know is that that, that they will, millions and millions and millions of people will overcome the beast by allowing themselves to be martyred. They will be given a reward and they will reign, rule and reign with Christ on earth for a thousand years. That's what's promised to them. Okay? But they will, that's what, that's what they have to overcome. And when they do so, Jesus becomes even more powerful. His kingdom overcomes and is putting all things under his feet. So all powers and principalities, all evil are going under the feet of Jesus Christ. And the church of Philadelphia, the, the those who cling to the word of Jesus Christ, who cling to the word, that cling to Jesus, will overcome. And we will put down these sorcerers, these Luciferians, and expose them before we are raptured out of here. So I just wanted you to see that. I think that was just fascinating to realize that that what that's what's going on right now. To be without spot or wrinkle, he is putting all powers and principalities under the feet of his bride. And the bride will be worshipped by the, the synagogue of Satan. Interesting. Isn't that interesting? That's interesting. I so I'm just amazed by this book. I'm amazed by God's word. I'm amazed by the book of Revelation. Anyway, if you have not given your life to Jesus Christ, re confess him as your Lord and Savior. Confess him as the living Son of God. Um, uh, and also to um, repent of your sins and be baptized. That means immersion in being baptized into Jesus, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And you will overcome. Okay? And also, I just want to remind you, and those who don't know, First Peter chapter 3. Baptism is likened into getting onto the ark. Okay, God bless and I'll talk to you later.